สวัสดีค่ะขอต้อนรับเข้าสู่งานอาสาฟอรัมนะคะวันนี้ก็เป็นวันสุดท้ายแล้วนะคะก็ก่อนที่จะเริ่มรายการนะคะขอประชาสัมพันธ์ด้วยกัน2เรื่องนะคะก็จะมีเรื่องของอแอชเชนอาร์คิเทคนะคะที่จะเริ่มขึ้นในปี2015นะคะหรือปีพศ2558นะคะก็ทางสมาคมสถาปนิกสยามนะคะร่วมกับสภาสถาปนิกก็ได้เล็งเห็นความสำคัญตรงนี้นะคะก็ซึ่งได้จัดงานสัมมนาเรื่องนี้ไปแล้วนะคะในวันศุกร์ที่ผ่านมาถ้าเกิดใครยังไม่ได้ไปฟังนะคะก็สามารถไปดูรายละเอียดนะคะได้ที่ www.asianarchitectcouncil.org นะคะหรือว่าเข้าไปใน Facebook นะคะแล้วก็เสิร์ชหาคำว่า Asian Architect Council ค่ะส่วนเรื่องที่สองนะคะก็จะเป็นเรื่องของอกิจกรรมเบนิสเบนเล่นะคะก็จะขอเชิญทุกท่านที่สนใจนะคะส่งผลงานออกแบบสถาปัตยกรรมหรือว่าแนวคิดการออกแบบสถาปัตยกรรมการตีความการออกแบบสถาปัตยกรรมนะคะ,ะตามแนวความคิดของเดวิดชิปเปอร์ฟิลนะคะภายใต้ธีมหลักของปีนี้ว่า Common Ground ค่ะซึ่งก็สามารถไปดูรายละเอียดเพิ่มเติมได้ที่ w w w a s a o r t h นะคะหรือว่าเข้าไปที่ w w w t h a i a r c h v e n i s o r g นะคะก็หลังจากนี้ก็จะเริ่มเข้าสู่เซสชันนะคะก็ขอพูดเป็นภาษาอังกฤษนะคะ Good morning and welcome to our s a f o r u m to the s u n t w e l f Today we have three sessions. The first session we will talk with Mr. n e t h e r t e r a n i and the second session in the afternoon will uh, Mr. b a r s Princeton, and the last session of today, Mr. m o g o t o t e n i j i r i will give us a talk. And before we start this session, uh, could you please turn off your mobile phone and uh, anyone who uh, want to take a photo? Please turn off your flat and the shutter sounds also. And anyone who can with your car, you can ask for the car park stamp at the front desk in front of the hall. And also, and also for your headphone, please control your volume to uh, appropriate sounds and make sure that it doesn't disturb the other. And uh, I would like to ask your help to help us to fill out the evaluation form and send it back to our staff. And the last thing is uh, in the interview section. Uh, if anyone has a question, you can write down your question on the paper and give it to our staff. So I think it's now time to uh, start the first session. So please welcome Kun Chat Pong s h i n r a d i m o n our moderators for today's session. Nader Tarani is a principal and founder of Nada, a practice dedicated to design innovation, the cultivation of a new methods of fabrication, interdisciplinary collaboration, and a productive dialogue with the construction industry. Uh, Mr. Tarani is also a professor and head of the Department of Architecture at MIT. As a founding principal of Office Da. Mr. Tarani received awards such as the Cooper Hewitt National Design Award in Architecture, the American Academy of Arts and Letters Award in Architecture, the United States Artists Architecture and Design Award, and 13 Progressive Architecture Awards. He was principal in charge of various projects such as the Hinman Research Building at Georgia Tech, the McAllen Building in Boston. Helios House in Los Angeles, Fleet Library at Rhode Island School of Design, and the, Tong and the Tongxian Art Gatehouse in Beijing. Mr. Tarani received a Bachelor's of Fine Arts and a Bachelor's of Architecture from the Rhode Island School of Design in 1985 and 1986, respectively, and continued his studies at Harvard University in the Graduate School of Design, where he received his MAUD in 1991. Mr. Tarani has also taught at Northeastern University, Rhode Island School of Design, and Harvard Graduate School of Design, and has held fellowships at Georgia Institute of Technology, University of Toronto, Otis College of Art and Design, and University of Melbourne. For me, it is a great personal pleasure to have Mr. Tarani in the ASA Forum, uh, as he was my professor, uh, thesis advisor, and more importantly, 
mentor and, and good friend. So without further ado, uh, here's Mr. Nader Tarani. Thank you. Thank you for the kind introduction. And it's a great honor to be back in uh, Thailand. Uh, my first visit here was uh, left me on a departure the day before 9-11. Quite a, a momentous occasion. Uh, but I've come back on numerous occasions now and uh, um, it's a great honor to be invited back again. The, excuse me, I think I did something wrong. Um, the point of departure for this discussion uh, goes back some years. It has to do with a narrative that is the cornerstone of many architectural problems. The Greek temple poses a kind of dichotomy between the actuality of architecture and its representational attributes. The ornamentation that you see on architecture, in this case the triglyphs, are a materialization of the very beams that in a way project themselves onto the surface. We all understand that and that emanates as a kind of truth in architecture. Until we turn the corner and we realize that those very triglyphs are the very element that turned the corner. And here, a fundamental and fatal crisis emerges right there in Western architecture. This either produces or exposes the fact that not only is this ornament suspicious or fake, but that in fact all of the ornament is fake, or alternatively it exposes an old fallacy, the notion that the structure needs to have any primacy over the ornament. Maybe the entire history of architecture is rooted in the primacy of ornament and not that of structure. This tension between the elements of structure an ornament is at the core of architecture even today. I'll try to go fast through some of this, but the entire lecture is organized on an array of projects that take you from the surface into the depth of the building and finally end up in the structural principle. Here in the McAllen building, uh, we invented a, uh, a space, excuse me, uh, a space uh, a courtyard between two buildings that framed the view of Boston, but the key element of the building had to do with a structural investigation that we did early in the project. It was to organize a building without any shear walls. The shear walls would have blocked the passage of traffic underneath, but also blocked the views on the side. This fundamental predicament made it impossible for us to design a building according to traditional structural principles. So the staggered truss that spans the entire width of the building also gave us the opportunity to span 72 feet without any disturbances. This in turn uh, enabled the uh, plucking in of many types of units as long as they respected the rationality and the verticality of the systems that need to service it, the water, the electrical, and the plumbing, and so forth, with many different apartment types that could occupy the bulk of this building. As a building like this, then, it gives you a more ceiling height than a normative building of this kind would do, and that the services are then only strategically placed around the corridor, and essentially the concrete floor is poured, the temporary walls are placed there and gives you the kind of flexibility that can move over time. Remember that when this was designed, built, and now five years later, we've already witnessed three economies. So the relationship between fixed structure and temporary structure 
becomes all the more potent as a real estate proposition here. If you look at the history of architecture and sculpture, you realize that there were significant benchmarks from the Egyptians to the Romans, for instance, where the idea of verisimilitude and realism uh, took shape in sculpting uh, figurality. But in fact, arguably, the idea of the bas relief is even a more sophisticated one because in the area, in the zone of flatness, the idea is to produce the illusion of depth where there is none. And architecture is constantly playing with this concept. It's a rare occasion that you can make a robust structural argument in architecture. Most architectures deal with program that flattens out the structure and represses it into a two-dimensional uh, face. And let's not be fooled. Even those architectures that are all about the exposure of structural uh, elements are designed in order to bring the skin of that structure to a fine point at the bird's beak in the corner. This building too by Foster is all about the skin. Even those structures that purport to be all about structure could have ornamented them in many different ways. And therefore, this is arguably another structure about the surface. So when we come to buildings like the Macallan, we know that there are multiple narratives at work. The deep structure within, and then the structure of the skin, which has its own value um, in relationship to the aluminum paneling systems, which fold in order to give structural integrity on their own, as well as radicalize the difference between flatness and depth on the other. And so, the skin of the Macallan really is a materialization of the tensions of what can it be achieved with the skin, giving it depth, but also materializing the structure in the deep sense of, of the word. Much of architecture then, as its foundation is dealt, is dealing with the negotiation of larger concepts that have to be broken down into smaller pieces, what I call aggregations. Here, in Ordos, China, we were one of 30 architects selected to do a project called 20 plus 10. 20 Chinese architects, 10 uh, foreign architects to do office complexes. The entire project is fueled by the uh, emerging economy of coal, and this becomes a mechanism, an economic mechanism, by which the entire industrial and business sector can be generated. In fact, there was very little design for us to do. They had already designed all of the volumes and the massing of the, uh, of the offices anyway. So our only task was to select which ones worked on our site, how they could be arranged, and therefore how they could take shape as an urban morphology. We discovered that volumes alone don't do enough for us. To join the two volumes, we could, in fact, get something larger than the sum of their parts. The intersection of two parts gives the possibility of connecting two real estate entities, but using the same operation, you could give them light, or if you like, make passages that connect two urban arenas together from one side to the other. The discovery of this old technique became a very important mechanism for us to begin to think through multiple strategies instead of isolating buildings or extending them as large slabs to imagine two critical configurations in which they come together, the orthogonal oblique and the oblique oblique. Now, as a real estate proposition, what this aggregative concept means is that one floor of, in the entire five buildings may operate as one, or they all may operate differently, or different sectors may conjoin with each other in different ways. But most importantly, urbanistically, it meant that we could aggregate them in such a way such that you can bring a public plaza 
to connect all of them together, and then come from the rear end to a parking that then formally connects to all of the volumes above, connecting them with a staircase on a diagonal plane that is the main plaza of this piece. What activates the scheme then is the way in which the truncations at the corners create entries, passages, spaces for light, and an entry to the garage. The anomaly to this scheme are the bullion cuts, and they in fact end up waking up the scheme. Double height spaces of cuts create the entries, the passages from the street to the plaza on the inside, large bullions that produce skylights for alternative working spaces that are double height spaces for conferences and other such events, and finally a connection, a formal connection between the vehicular and the pedestrian, something that is commonly overseen in these scenarios. Putting it all together then, we realized that we could get the same amount of real estate by conjoining five volumes and connecting them both, getting rid of the six and creating a public space on the interior that activates a sense of public cohesion on the interior and then connecting to the outside by way of the passages that bring through people from the urban context. The skin of the building now has to play a similar kind of game, but all for very different kinds of reasons. This is, at the end, an office complex, so it will be occupied in many different ways, and so we developed a pattern such that a wall could intersect at any perpendicular moment in any way we liked. But we wanted there to be a significant relationship between the part, on the one hand, and the whole. Here, let's go back to the temple and imagine that the excavations that we do on the skin may establish a kind of sculptural um, excavation that operates at the small scale in a similar way as what we were intending to do at the larger scale figure. In doing so, we produce a skin that ironically is not perfect plumb and flush. Given our inability to control the site conditions from afar, the misalignments between all of these panels produce the possibility of creating a high level of tolerance so that in fact it can actually be built extremely badly and still produce a very great architectural results. My obsession with problems of structure and skin obviously go back deep into history and not just Western architecture. In Eastern architecture, we're able to see the transition from the Seljuk period to the Safavi period and the Gajar period, all of which deal with masonry structures. In the first instance, the brick, what you see as ornament is actually structural and is deeply embedded in the wall. In the second, the brick is structural, but a, a veneer of brick. And in the third instance, it's actually just a tile, a representation of what's behind it. And various histories of these different architectures expose the different ways in which uh, these different surface and structural conditions speak to each other. But all of them, arguably, have a truth or a logic a tectonic logic embedded in each one of them, and none of them can be argued to be morally on a higher ground than the next one. What motivates, in great part, our critique of contemporary architecture emerges then with this image. Uh, Gary, in a way, uprooted many of the conventions of architecture with the digital experimentations he did, but at the time he was doing them, you can see a complete disregard between surface and the space that's contained behind it. And the syntax of the aggregate of unit uh, is altogether absent. It doesn't know how to turn a corner. It doesn't know how to meet the top. It's just a wallpaper. So much of our project really emerged as a study 
of negotiating the relationship between surface and space and the logic of construction that emerges from it. This building, in fact, is an addition onto an existing building using corrugated uh, copper as a new sheathing material that wraps over the existing structure. Corrugation produces the possibility of a rigid structural axis on one axis and a malleable axis on the horizontal, unrolling in order to insert a stair that connects the two. What is amazing about this is that it shows the direct relationship between the act of drawing and the act of construction. In architecture, drawing is not an illustrative process. It is a construction process in and of itself. And so by virtue of knowing that the top line is exactly the same length as the bottom, you know that it's a ruled surface, and if it's a ruled surface, it means it is buildable. In that same way, when we build, we have and establish a direct relationship between the unit of construction and the overall mass of a building. Uh, the figure of the overall architecture has always to do something with the unit of construction that makes that possible. As a transformation of the serpentine wall at the University of Virginia, we developed a folded wall that has and gains lateral stability through its undulation. But we add one more device to this architecture. What we do is that we say that the logic of the brick is organized along the diagonal so that we never have to cut any brick. And in doing so, we may look into the bonding as a way of expanding and contracting the logic of the mortar, left and right, and bringing beyond the structural element an, an element of light and air into the architecture. As it turns out, the clients of that project divorced and we never got to build it. But instead, we got to experiment in a wood structure in Mantra, a restaurant in Boston, how to do this. And this was a very important act because we were young architects. Uh, the project came about eight times the price at $200,000. And so we had to develop a means and methods of how to build it. And this is really the working drawing. A plan and a section could not tell us how to build it. So we realized that with a unit of construction, a piece of wood about this long, we could develop a working drawing much like this and paste that working drawing up on the ceiling like that. And by hanging plumb bobs, we could bring to within a sixteenth of an inch the exact location of every single intersection stack them like masonry structure to produce a surface active structural member that is a screen for the dome beyond. Remember, that surface there is identical in dimension to that surface there, only unfolded. Our fascination with structure then emerges from the two-dimensional to the two-and-a-half-dimensional where coffering becomes a major element that brings together and makes cohere a large urban project that operates at almost this dimension of a, a kilometer that brings together a spa, a mall, a convention center, an arena, a hotel, and many other instruments. A coffered structural ceiling acts as the fifth facade of this structure. But then, the coffering is organized in geometries that conform to the exact typologies of structures that underlie them. And by doing that, we use circular coffering to transform to hexagonal coffering for the arena. From the hexagonal, we compress it to the running bond pattern for the supports. The staggered bond shifts to the grid in order to create the structure for the shops. And of course, the triangulation expands in order to 
conform to the logic of the auditoria that underlie in the convention halls. All of these as a topological system that speak to the types that underlie them. The building then is actually quite sober. It is an urban development that was slated to be built without any housing. We built the housing as a shading device for the public space underneath in the context of Kuwait and give it an added environmental breadth to expand the winter months by two months in either direction to give a well-ventilated space underneath. Again, we won the competition, no divorces this time, the economy fell, and we were left to build another art installation out of it. This time, rationalizing the system, not in different shapes, but in a self-similar shape, the Voronoi pattern in this case, that becomes the basis of experimenting on how to develop a wall system that turns into an arch system, that turns into a dome system. Now, the problem with that, of course, is that we were not structural engineers and we consistently make mistakes. And so the entire structure collapsed. Why? Because when coffering comes down on the side, it has no structural rigidity, it's buoyant. And so the whole thing collapsed and we had to, in fact, suspend this dome with strings from above, painted black so you don't see them. And we had to build it again, this time in China, as purely a structural exercise. A dome on one side with a kind of compressive series of forces, and a bowl on the other side with tensile forces operating together. This time, we extended the logic of the keystone down to the base, and by not making this parallel, we were able to make a veritable structure that could withstand the weight of the makers on top of them. The dish is, of course, on the other side, and the two pieces come together. This uh, preoccupation with structure really extends uh, a long time in my past, but it ironically happens to be the one exam that is keeping me away from being a registered architect. So it kind of is a, uh, is a deep-seated crisis in my practice. At around the same time that I was doing that structure, I went to Japan and absolutely fascinated with uh, uh, Todd's, Ito's Todd's, and the relationship the structural system gains with the trees in front of it. This figural dialogue it has with the foreground was fascinating. But I was let down. I went inside and realized that it's just a conventional modern building with a kind of structural skin on the outside and falls into the trap that we know so much all too well since the 70s, uh, a dialogue between the duck and the decorated shed. These two systems cannot, uh, in a way, escape each other unless the structure is asked to perform in a spatial way. So, when we were asked, when we were shortlisted for a major competition on, uh, in Beirut for the AUB, we were put, many, many young architects, together to compete for a major public building with one of their alma mater. The, the name of that person was Zaha Hadid. And so we decided we're not going to win, so we're going to do what we really like to do. And what I really like to do is to correct Toyo Ito. <laughs> so I said, okay, this is the right moment to do this thing. The site is in a bosque of trees, and the urban context in which this building occurs is not really the context of architectural history. It's the natural configuration of the trees within which it is embedded. So even before we started designing, I knew that we wanted our building to disappear in the context of trees. Its context was the natural context. We developed a geometric system that negotiates between the hexagon and the triangle that enables us to produce a column, a pilotis. It can rotate to transfer structure from one axis to the other or make a generic wall. At the scale of a unit, 
our geometric invention can do any of that. But then, from the base to the top, it needs to navigate complex structural situations. Heavy and spatialized at the bottom, it transfers in the middle, it lightens at the top, and it branches out for the discrete members that happen at the top of the building, much like a tree would. But most importantly, it takes a conventional domino frame and it acknowledges that sometimes you have long span members from within the building, so you need transfer beams. In the context of the bosque of trees to the one side, you may need to cantilever, so you recess the structure. Or auditoria may distort that structure in different ways, or you lighten up the structure as you get to the top. This then becomes a structural system that materializes the organization of the building in the structural depth of the building. The building being stacked programmatically on top of each other with a very tight footprint produces a promenade that's circular and in fact organizes the building on its relationship to the city, to the quad, to the Mediterranean and all of the different facets. And because of that, it's actually structurally irrational. We end up stacking the major program not on top of each other, but in rotated arenas so that they can have a prime relationship with one of these public spaces. Here, the library, for instance, looks out onto the Mediterranean, which is the opportunity to transfer the structure from the auditorium below to the offices above and gain a perspective over the bosque of trees uh, to the seas beyond. Right there. The building then is an exercise, if you like, it's an extension of Ito's project, but essentially bringing the idea of the circulation, the structure, the skin and the program into a critical dialogue with each other. This is a moment where figures and configurations of architecture are in direct dialogue with each other. Figuration in architecture is that moment where you can identify typologies by just naming them. If I say basilica, you know I mean a cross plan like this. If I say rotunda, you know I'm talking about a circular building. And these produce consistent and strange predicaments in architecture. For instance, here, the figure of the telephone booth becomes the housing for American football players to stuff themselves in each other to see who can win. The person, the team that gets the most amount of men in them uh, produces uh, a kind of delight for the American system and uh, gets them some kind of award. But the payback, I don't know what it is beyond the erotic dimension it offers. What is important though, architecturally, is that you see that there's no relationship between the figure of the telephone booth and its stuffing. It's more like taxidermy. These two things operate separately. And in essence, the architecture is a skin for the organs that are inside of it. Not so interesting. The argument that I've been constructing is actually rooted on systems and rules, regulations, parameters, all of those things which make architecture a thicker plot. The game Twister, if played through a similar logic, uh, lays out a certain terrain and with a certain rolling of dice, you get to put your arms and your feet in different locations, producing a figural dimension that arguably is much more pleasurable than the, play the, 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 the results of this. That game may produce many figures outside of this. It produces parameters for an architecture to come. Our architecture is constantly oscillating back and forth between the cultural conventions that force us to do things and this space of invention which is uh, exacted by such games that we invent. Now, completely converse to what we really are trying to do, which is this, produce all of the rules of the game to produce a perfect and structurally customized tensegrity structure for which we designed the Guangzhou Biennale structure, we built, uh, we, we drew construction documents this thick and we were five days from construction when they came back to us and said, we like it very much, but can you please draw the tensegrity structure 
without any tensile elements, only compressive elements. So we scratched our head and we said, well, that's essentially a new thing. So we went back and we re-evaluated what the building or the structure was about. It's on a tight site on the corner of one of the historic corners. There's two trees and many infrastructural elements underneath that you cannot disturb. The maximum size is to occupy the corner. And essentially, it's so crowded underneath that you can only lift a structure above it. But by lifting the structure above, you also want to give space for the trees to come through. So, effectively, what we designed was not a structure. We designed the formwork for a structure that would bring together the structural forces of the legs and the cloud above through compressive members that are welded together with the logic of the maximum forces that are acting on it, the maximum moment, the maximum compressive moment, so that the density of the welds is essentially determined by where you need the most mass. The building then is the result of an empirical process where we are exact with the formwork but the welder can keep adding more pieces as he or she shakes it to see whether it's structurally determinate or not. In that sense, it is really an ephemeral cloud, in this case, scripted, exacted, structurally developed according to very, very sophisticated software, but in fact built to a fault by really empirical processes that test it through manual motion like this. It is the first of a series of Guangzhou Biennales which are determined to build and keep these installations there on site as part of its uh, legacy. Now, the dialogue between figuration and configuration is best illustrated by this. These two artifacts are effectively the same thing, maybe the two sides of a, the same coin. Here, a cast concrete bowl is composed of small aggregates, but through its polishing and through its casting, erases any, um, any evidence of the aggregate. Here, the nest is a materialization of every single blade of grass that brings together the shape of the bowl. These two are somehow always in evidence and in tension in our architecture. The two of which also produce a kind of interesting relationship between reading and the surface. Here, arguably, the shape of the snake is in dialogue with the very surface of the snake. The surface of the snake is a shingling system that enables it to ex uh, expand and contract in relationship to the content it is ingesting. This idea of shrink wrapping also has to do with a, a, an element of economy, semantic economy, not financial economy. In the New England house, we developed a structure that is tightly wrapped around the program of the house. If you look carefully, the, the chimney here, the staircase to the north, the bathrooms, the toilets, everything is a materialization of, of the content of the building. The construction of the building then is a series of veneers, and as you go up there, you witness the American construction industry in their plaster, in their plywood, all of that going up the stairs towards the light, and towards the view to the northern woods. Looking back on the design then, we see the role of the stair as it is extracted, torn in a way, shredded from the architecture, delaminated as part of the expression of this building. Now what's more important is with all of the discussions I've been having about aggregations and the exactitude of the construction of this building, there's an ethic about how we build things. Even so far as to say, when there's hardware to it, we will refuse to specify hardware. 
the door handles to the garage are really an extension of the board and batten structural system of the skin. But then it's the breaking of the rules that make the most, if you like, salient figures on the surface of the building. The ramp and the stair that go up are a kind of ominous reminder of figuration at work, even when it goes against the logic of construction. Meaning then in architecture is constructed not in a singular way, but in an ambiguous way. The little prince shows us how the relationship between the snake and its content is seen in two different ways, at least, that it can be read as a hat or an elephant ingested, but that in a way there's an arbitrary relationship between the signifier and the signified. This is a structure now that is all about air. It's a very temporary structure that we developed in relationship to the skyline of Boston. It is meant to be an urban artifact that you can circulate around. It has an arcade that is filled with people. It is meant to be seen as a kind of icon against the sky at night. And it has an exact reading in relationship to the institution for which it bears its name. And it is inflated, so it has something to do with the logic of air as it expands the structure itself. It is a structure for the 150th anniversary of MIT, and it is the basis for a screen, a screen on which the history of MIT, its arts and its culture is projected onto that surface. A kind of tension is then born out of this logic First, by constructing it, and second, by the way in which the projections offer an exact replica of it, but then in tension with it, expand and contract and begin to establish a, an ambiguous relationship between the actual artifact and the projected artifact. You can see the Prudential building in the back. The figure is right there, and it comes back together over there. Here, the figure drives the scheme, and its configurative parts are then projected onto it. There are projects that we do, in fact, that give primacy to the figure, and projects that you can control less. This is an important one. It's a project for the Samsung uh, Model Home Gallery. Model Home Galleries are essentially black boxes that are filled with model homes at the top, with public spaces at the bottom that cater to the community in which these structures have been placed. They sell apartments, they're selling devices. And in order to sell maybe 20, 30 apartments, buildings, units in, inside them, the public amenities are given as a kind of payback to the community. With the economy being what it is, the spectacle that was afforded by these was not able to be had in our structure. So, in fact, we had to reduce it and understand the irreducible elements of these uh, structural systems. One is a glass base that is absolutely public and open to the people. And two, a black box at the top that is a strong figure that is able to operate as an icon or as a monument. Being Next to a park and a major public crossing, we knew that this crossing remains an important element within the landscape. So our main task was to bring the people through here with the black box above, bring the architecture down, and essentially from the top down, bring the structure, bring the information booth, bring the staircases down, bring the bathrooms down, essentially invert the traditional relationship between foundation and building and hang the building from above. The ceiling then becomes the repository for all of the programmatic systems that are embedded in the building, not only lighting systems, but fire suppression systems, mechanical systems, and laterally then that enables you to make fluid connections between the different public elements, the auditorium, the galleries. But the plan is meant to be a hypostyle hall, an open hall that sometimes enables the insertion of different programs, albeit the auditorium being a big one, 
but the VIP rooms and some of the other elements being large versions of the very small columns that you see around. This is a building that keeps changing over time. It's under construction now, and it keeps changing. But essentially, the hyperstyle hall has a logic that drags from the top, and then the structural system on the sides is absolutely porous. Its intention is to bring the landscape from the inside out and from the outside in, and really thins out that structural system on the edge. There are then two operating systems. The skin on the outside is all about the vert verticality of very thin T-sections that are at once structure, mullions, as well as small fritting uh, to protect against the sun. The entire base reads as a kind of barcode that is organized against its direct context. And it undulates in relationship to urban responses. Sometimes there's double height spaces, sometimes there's two floors. But effectively, it's a very conventional system at its base with a domino frame at the top that can be carved to give a strong, iconic presence in the landscape. These are two building types that operate within two scales of the landscape. The base establishes a relationship with the landscape of the ground, and the top establishes a relationship with the uh, mountains and the, the larger urban skyline beyond. This is a building that, while it is very much rooted in the urban landscape, is much about the distant landscape of Seoul. The skin, then, at the top is all, all about the horizontality of, of, of the building. This is a building that we drew up meticulously and detailed for months and months and months and handed the drawings in December, and then we heard nothing from the clients anymore for about three months. I received this image about two weeks ago to say, OK, we're here. Now we need you to start working on our construction administration. So tomorrow I fly to Seoul to see what it is that this building is. The horizontal system, then, is about an abstraction. It is a building without windows. It has very few windows that are inserted uh, in that mass. And essentially, they bring together these two systems. The two systems, again, the base with a kind of vertical barcoding. It is a glass system that is meant to be absent. It's arranged to calibrate its relationship with the urban context, the sun, and the park. The roof is a dumb roof. The weight of the building on top bears down on it, and the program exacts its form, and the horizontal systems of the cladding above hide the tectonic inequities behind it and open up some windows to behind. The way in which we look at figurations and configurations have put us in a moment of our studies now where we're looking back at some of the key elements of typology and the building of organizations. This next building is a house in France that is essentially a courtyard building. The deformations of that courtyard building happen because of the slope of the site and because of the rotation of the plan of the site. But essentially, it is a building that has two staircases on each corner and two entries and exits on the op opposite corners, operating at two levels as a continuous ring. But really, it's two buildings brought together around a swimming pool. A bottom level that is on the level of the landscape and a top level that overlooks it towards the Mediterranean and a courtyard occupied by a swimming pool. The top level, very simply, has all of the living areas over here and the entry climbs up to it from that zone and it looks out in an expanded way over the horizon with a master sequence here. The entry then sets up a large proscenium that blocks the view, and only after entry do you begin to see the horizontal expanse that opens out onto the Mediterranean. 
As a modern building, it's a transformation of the case study houses. An extruded glass box, completely glass on one side, and biasing the horizontal, we also open up cavities on the opposite side to introduce the possibility of light, air, and a view onto the pinus pinae, which are beautiful trees on the opposite side, to activate the house. In southern France, all of the views always look at the, at the sea, but none of them look behind. This is a way of producing a structural vaulting system that is not only spanning in this way, but also in the long way to begin to imagine a different kind of a way of engaging the site with smaller views and beginning to uh, amplify the potential of the site in relationship to its natural context. The logic of the plan then distorts in relationship to the site, expanding its views on one side, exacting smaller views on the other side, establishing the fact that the site is sloped, the building staggers and becomes two levels, corresponding to the code that requires it to step down, becoming two-sided, the vaulting of the roofs on one side look uphill, and the slippage between the two wings produces this monumental archway that brings together the upper landscape to the lower landscape. The way in which a conventional typology is now transformed by its relationship with the landscape is radicalized in this one clear moment. And this is all about a structural moment. This is no longer about surfaces. This is about a wall that is a retaining wall for the swimming pool that comes out to support a perpendicular beam that is the main facade of the building upon its entry, the end condition of which is raked at the exact slope of the stair. This building then has two entries to it, a landscape entry and a formal entry, and the landscape entry goes up and witnesses the view into the pool on its way up, and then expands into the living area, but blocks the immediate neighbors that are just behind here and just behind here. The structural wall in question, though, is a major organizing element. It is the retaining wall against the pool, but it's also the wall that organizes all of the services and the bathrooms on the other side. As you go up, that same wall divides the sleeping area of the master bedroom with its lounge, and you have to climb through the wall in order to get from one side to the other. The organization of the bedrooms are not like traditional bedrooms, they're like dormitories, and anybody can use these bathrooms. It's a, it's a house that can go from seven people to 21 people, de depending on how you frame it. It's very much about extending the landscape from the inside out, and uh, breaches all of the traditional boundaries, bringing the terracotta deep into the bedrooms and even into the corridors. The bedroom materials comes into the corridors in the same way as the bathroom tile comes in out from the bathrooms and essentially activates what would otherwise be a, a circulation space. That retaining wall then is then tiled inside the bathroom and so that retaining wall has a view into the pool. This is a shower and the sink. The view back into the pool a kind of homework area, and then in the family area, a view back into the pool again uh, from that window. All of this is a kind of horizontal stratification with some key moments in the vertical. Now, why is this different than other projects? Unlike wood, unlike brick, unlike um, uh, other projects which require the identification of a material unit, concrete is a liquid or it's a, it's a series of small aggregates that with liquid take form. And essentially, they become either the impression of the board work that is at work, or the kind of blasting that you do at it, or the scratching, or whatever manipulation you do post facto. When you look at the experimental projects of Fizak, or some of our uh, more recent contemporary experimentalists like Cutlass, 
you realize that there's a direct relationship with, between the form work and the kinds of ways in which liquid and gravity act on each other. But this sets you up in two kinds of paradigms. On the one hand, there's a representational paradigm whereby the rustication and the form work begins to exact an idea about the aggregates as represented on the surface, the way in which concrete begins to amass different forms to give you the impression of stone, or, on the other hand, a very different acknowledgement of the actual aggregates that go into concrete, that they start from the smooth concrete with small aggregates, and then the exposure of fine aggregates within the concrete wall that slowly, slowly become larger rocks and begin to take on the impression of an actual load-bearing wall. These two systems are competing systems that are then subjected to very different relationships on this building. And this is in progress, so we haven't decided which way to go. But the concrete obviously then operates in a completely different way than would be other systems. It's, this project is very much a, a project about the landscape, so I could talk further about that, but suffice it to say that the horticultural systems, the natural systems at work, and the integration of the architecture into the landscape is very much at stake for making it disappear on the one hand, while making it, of course, absolutely present on the other side. The construction of the ground is not natural. It is absolutely architectural, but it's also very stubborn. Everybody knows that the ground is what we occupy, and it doesn't, it's not very forgiving in terms of programming. Whereas the dome, the sky is actually quite forgiving and is the location where experimentations of structure, of space, of light, and a range of other symbolic attributes inside and outside have occurred throughout history. But let's look again. We're not talking about a dome here. We're talking about two domes, one on the inside and one on the outside, and they are the repository of two very different agendas, one about the representation of the heavens from the interior and one about the representation of a strong institutional uh, icon in the city's skyline. This brings us back to the whole relationship between form and content, between figure and configuration. We are constantly amazed in contemporary architecture at the kind of formal experimentation that's done by our cohorts and always let down when we realize that there's no spatial implications to those, uh, to those experiments. The idea that these flat floors are just a stuffing within that uh, is a complete letdown. There are exceptions to this, of course, and Rem proved in Jussieu how the ground is animate. The ground is the dome, the ground is constructed, the ground reconfigures typologies. But only 1% of buildings really operate at this level. The majority of buildings that you and I deal with operate at a completely different level. And sometimes we have to go outside of our conventional realm in order to test these out. In this case, looking at the sartorial trade and how darting and pleating may enable us to create hung ceilings that address a vast array of possibilities to conceal the very mechanical systems that are otherwise hidden by traditional uh, hung ceilings. Or on the floor, raised floor systems that hide all of the wiring and all of the services below. The architecture of today is made up of the same laminar systems as the historical ones, but they're here to service a vast array of infrastructure that does not raise, rise to the occasion of architecture. So, for this, we have done other experiments. Uh, for instance, in bank restaurant, where a completely flexible ground was needed, we hung everything once again upside down with the structural, the services, and, and the representation elements all coming from the roof down, producing the illusion of a constant surface on one axis, 
all of the mechanical systems, the programmatic systems, the venting, everything becoming in a way shrink-wrapped upside down, but then exposed almost like the side of a theater set as you look up from the side. It's not an accident that a lot of innovation has happened in the history of architecture in structure itself. It is the one most indispensable element that brings things together. But why is it that all of those experiments rarely come together? I mean, this is a vector active system, a, a truss. This is a form active system, uh, an arch. This is a surface active system, a shell. All of these are arguably three key structural moments of innovation in architecture, and nobody has yet brought these two together. We're not really surprised when we look at natural systems and recognize the relationship between water, snow, ice, and steam. These are all the same. But we have yet to come up with an architectural DNA that is able to transition from one state to another and another. And because we lacked a brick to do so, we invented a parametric unit to be able to go from a stacked system to a laterally braced wall, to a spanning truss, to a cantilever. Essentially, a topological system that has the ability to respond to structural variations all within one structural unit. The stacked masonry, the undulating wall laterally braced, just like the Venezuela house, the span of the truss from one side to the other, the organization of the vertical column of plastic units is identical to the beams here, all rotating in space, and finally the cantilever that exerts itself from the other side. The Hinman building, for which the previous project was designed as an experiment, was a commission that came out of that. It's an existing building with a huge and monumental research laboratory on the interior. But for the new architecture building, they required a hell of a lot of new program in there. So the question was, how do we get all that new program in there? And we knew, in order to keep it flexible, the chances are we're going to have to hang it from the top. So the concept became, if we can hang it from the top, we can keep the maximal, maximum flexibility on the ground to create interdisciplinary work and reconfigure the space in any way we want. And in fact, repurpose the crane that used to be mobile to introduce a whole new studio space on top in which all of the new programs would go. The logic of the project then is about a flexible ground that can be reconfigured, a truss and a, uh, a crane that support the entire scheme, the new studio space, a new staircase that is hung from the top and connects to the ground, a lighting system that is flexible enough to pull up in order that the students can experiment with building really tall structures on the inside. In turn, it gives a kind of horizontal flexibility to engage with other programs on either side, bringing those programs into the high bay. In addition to that, the uh, guillotine wall connects to an exhi exhibit space beyond there and the fabrication lab on one side a kind of shrink-wrapped mesh stair connecting on the southern side. The hung studio almost doesn't touch the sides, suspended from above and just delicately touches a table on this end. And the stair itself, all of the elements with the lighting slung from top um, coming together from one side. Really a delicate piece of architecture that is woven together with a lot of the industrial elements that were germane to the existing building. In fact, the original sign was called research because it was a research lab. We did a, a little bit of work on the metalwork so that the rees kind of depresses back so the word arc for architecture begins to rise up uh, for the occasion. Now, as a preamble to the end, and the timing doesn't seem that bad, actually. I uh, present the final project, the Melbourne University School of Architecture, uh, an ambitious project at the heart of the campus 
with a very stubborn site that is lodged around the concrete lawn, the main public space to the west, and the introduction of a new public space to the east next to the Elizabeth Murdoch building. The existing architecture building is like a fortress with nobody able to enter it. Part of our mission was to bring a connection from the western campus to the eastern campus and back to Melbourne on that side while reinforcing the circulation this way also. An existing structure called the Joseph Reed facade produces a very noble classical facade that in fact blocks the relationship with the plaza. This building was never part of this site. It was built in downtown Melbourne, but then some 50 years ago was brought here as a symbolic attribute. But this was a major element of the competition that we had to deal with. The organization of the site plan was then acknowledging of the quads that are so endemic and important to that site. And we learned very soon that the only way to fit all the program was to expand it and produce a new courtyard on the interior of the building. A volume which has all of the multifunctional elements of the School of Architecture nested inside of it. Within the context of that building then, is a huge void. That entire void is where the life of the building occurs. The Joseph Reed facade, a new circulation facade, another two planes connect the east and the west side together. On the inside, an experimental studio, the visiting critic studio, as well as the crit space occupy these main vo the main volume and create a kind of momentous occasion within the context of the core. The ground is the plaza of the building on the Piano Nobile, which becomes the structural basis for a locker system where the entire school comes together around uh, essentially the, the main space. The lockers enclose a space and distort ac according to the program that they hold with a bleacher system that produces a classroom on the interior of this facing backwards and a bleacher system that opens out on the other side, protected acoustically from the opposite side. Accordingly, the ceiling sponsors another program. For daylighting purposes, all of the light is oriented towards uh, the south, which is northern light for us. Actually, are we below or above the equator? I don't know. But the structural system here then suspends the visiting critics uh, studios from within. All of this is made out of uh, LVL wood and then goes from massive timbers to light veneer plywood systems at its base and it contains the, the heart and soul of the visiting critics studio. In a similar way, the Joseph Reed facade that pr produces a very noble but uh, blank system against the concrete lawn is activated for the first time in 50 years. We buttress it up with structural members. We put a new face onto it on the inside. We pop new holes into it so that we can maximize the relationship between occupi occupiable spaces on the interior and the inside of the building. But then, most importantly, we erect out of that, a new studio and crit space that projects and connects back to the circulation element of the building on the backside. These three main attributes bring together the major public components of the building and activate the building. In conclusion, there are Going back to the temple, the classical temple, there are two modalities, two paradigms in architecture that are constantly at conflict with each other. One of them has to do with representation and the other one has to do with form. Uh, or, excuse me, one of them has to do with representation and form, the other one has to do with performance and function, if you like. The image on the wall is of Burt Reynolds. I doubt many of you know who he is, but he was a major 
heartthrob in the 1970s in the United States. He was the symbol that all women and some men look towards as a kind of uh, icon, a giant. This is a critical moment in his career when he was at the top of his game. And if you look carefully, uh, it's at a moment in his youth when he's beginning to show the signs of age. The way you notice that is that if you look carefully at the hair, you realize that the hair is floating about a centimeter off his head. This is the beginning of what's called a comb over. By combing the hair over like this, you are representing a full head of hair when there is none. And that is the moment of maximum crisis for a man of such virile properties. The next image is of another man in a critical phase of his life, where by now, ostensibly bald, he is doing a radical comb-over that for you makes you think that this man is in total denial because he really thinks that that represents hair. But of course we know that there is no hair under that. So there's an alternative argument that I'll pose to you here. This man is not in denial. He is in awe at the relationship of performance and representation. He wakes up every morning thinking about the spherical condition of his head and the way in which he can construct linear, linear geometries that go over it and establish a rigorous relationship between lines and a three-dimensional volume. That's a form of performance. The last example, of course, is a more contemporary one <laughs> and is more interesting because we can't imagine, is this Justin Bieber projecting forth a new fad? Is he seeing towards the future the idea that he can transform culture through a hairstyle? Or is he already seeing his own demise as he loses his hair and is in necessity of a hairstyle that conceals that very condition? Architecture is in constant uh, negotiation with these two polarities. Uh, my architecture, my teaching, and the kinds of uh, discursive elements that I like to bring together are lodged within these two systems and modalities. If you look at the courtyard of Santa Maria de la Pace, you're in awe of the classical systems at work. But also, if you look more closely towards the corners, you realize that Bramante forgot that the classical systems would get swallowed up. Look at the Ionic corner. It's swallowed up by his architecture. Is this a moment of perversion or is this a moment of negligence? We don't know, but we're, uh, somehow our, uh, our interest in architecture is expanded by this oversight. A different kind of modality produces the kind of experimentation we've seen with catenary systems of, uh, of Gaudi, as well as the radical experimentation between typology, materiality and engineering by Eladio Dieste. Uh, I would like to propose a modality of operation that does not set these two in opposition to each other, but that brings them into a productive conversation with each other. Thank you very much. Please have a seat. Thank you very much for that inspirational lecture. Uh, there are quite a few projects I hadn't seen before, even though I'm a big fan of your work. Um, the first couple of questions, um, before we get some more questions from the floor, um, I'd like to direct these questions because we have a lot of students and young architects up and coming in Thailand, and, and I think uh, these first questions would benefit them. Um, even in your slides, uh, we see references to work of other architects, whether they're historical or contemporaries. I think that's interesting because even when I was in school with you, the things I enjoyed most weren't really talking about my projects, but actually talking about what Herzog de Moran was doing, what Ciso was doing, what, you know, Corbu had done. Um, please tell us what you think about Situating, situating your work uh, and not just fulfilling your own d 
desires and obsessions uh, with what you want to do, but also situating your work with respect to your contemporaries and even architects before you? Well, by way of introduction, I would say that it's a rare occasion that uh, people, architects, get to invent. Invention really happens in a very thin layer of what one is doing. The, the majority of what one does is inherit uh, building systems from the industry, typologies from real estate, conventions from culture, so many things that uh, bear a certain weight on what you do that to not acknowledge them is to be innocent about all of these forces at work. Now, acknowledging them does not mean that you're um, bending to them uncritically. Uh, our, our responsibility, arguably, is to be engaging them in a discursive way. That is, you, you learn what Mies did, you look at what Korb did, you, you are looking at your contemporaries, but with a critical eye towards how you're positioning yourself with respect to some of those practices. In the context of contemporary practice, of course, um, we've taken on many roles. Um, one of them, let's say, while you were at school, was the emerging and centrality of the digital revolution in architecture. While Colombia, let's say, was invested in the advent of visualization and morphology, we were not looking at uh, digitization as a, as a mechanism for liberating form. We were looking at it as a constructive mechanism. Later, let's say in the last five, ten years where uh, the incorporation of digital architecture towards fabrication has become now more conventional, we are now looking towards breaking the boundaries between architecture and other disciplines because we can only see the degree to which all of this requires to be integrated in order that it not be value engineered out of architecture. So there's a, there's a, a lot of debates that are central to, to practice that we bring to bear on this. Uh, I, I think actually we're not alone in this, but maybe we're different in that we acknowledge it. Somebody like Rem rarely acknowledges the footprints on, on which he walks. Uh, sometimes he does a lot to even hide them, but in fact it's arguable that he's the most uh, historically astute architect. He knows his references and uh, the contributions of the modern canons better than anybody else in order precisely to manipulate them the way that he does. So I, uh, I am interested in an erudite relationship with history, uh, not only as the basis for a kind of debate, but also as a repository for architectural advancement and manipulation, acknowledging that at any given moment, it's a very hard thing to invent at that scale. Right. It's, 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 you're able to operate at increments. And the, the Beirut project was really an, uh, a kind of case study of that. Knowing what's wrong with Ito is more important than producing our own invention, because that's the springboard from which it occurred. Well, well I think th that's important. and if if you look at it from the perspective of, of, of a student, um, when you talk about somebody else's work, there's always taboo. Um, in the context of Asia, where you have students who are good little boys and good little girls who don't challenge their professors or whoever, or even the stuff they see in magazines, and they would never put their work right next up to, to the work that, of whom they've respected, um, I think it's an important point. I think if, if you look at this in a different way uh, from what we can learn from this is it's always empowering to see your work uh, and be brave enough to, to put it in front of a, a work that you, uh, and compare it, or not compare it, but basically put it in context next to work that you respect. And I think in the end, it, challenging what's existing always helps lift architecture as a whole, which I think your work has done. But behind your question, there's two myths. Yes. One is the myth of originality, the notion that you sit at your table 
and through your own genius somehow come up with something that's never been done before. And the other myth is the notion of authority, that your professors are somehow ordained with some higher order of knowledge than you, that you don't have the ability to, to challenge them. And in fact, we know that both of those are untrue. Right, right. Um, another question uh, we have, um, basically, when I, even when I was in school, uh, my classmates and I uh, all agreed that uh, your drawings or your models were quite beautiful. The, uh, the best drawings that we had seen, um, not because they were technically more proficient or whatever, but they had a quality about them that was beautiful, but also uh, communicate construction. And I think it's a, a lot of that is missing in the presentation drawings uh, or whatever conceptual drawings we see these days. We see a lot of computer renderings that are, are basically just illustrations. Talk about your attitude towards drawing as a tool or building models, and mo more recently, your, even your animations and how that contributes to your, your own design process. Well, um, one critical point I try to make in the middle of the lecture is that for us, drawing is the beginning of construction. In other words, you build an entire building on paper first before it gets built out there on the site. So how, how to develop techniques through plan, through section, through axonometrics, through explosions of of giving the manual for construction has always been important to us. In the American context where you don't get to graduate and start building immediately, the models that we built, which were at half inch scale, what to you would be about one to 20th scale, are, are also big. Big enough that they can simulate construction systems. They're big enough that they can look like built buildings but actually work like built buildings. You, know, you begin to almost simulate their structural conditions and all of that, so they, they are, they're not merely representations of buildings, they're also simulations of buildings. That was a, a key step for us. And almost became a compensatory strategy. We knew this is not gonna get built, so we had to build something that could make it as convincing as something that had been built. Um, Part of the drawings we do are part of the arc of experimentation that you make mistakes in order to get someplace. But there's another arc that goes this way, that there's a moment where you know where you've gotten, and you need to also be able to break it down and synthesize it to its core thesis. Many of the animations you see here are the net result of these two processes. Some of them we were doing while they were developing, some of them we did after when it was all over as a way of saying, you know what? We did many things in the process, but out of the 100% of that process, only 40% of it is relevant, and that's what we're documenting in, th in these animations. So some of them have a, an important conceptual aspect towards developing the idea of the project. Some of it is a synthesis that is about uh, identifying the thesis after the fact. Uh, we have a few questions from the floor. Um, do you use any computer software program to generate form? Or can you suggest some? <laughs> I, we use Rhino. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think you use... A, you, I, can I just respect... Yeah. Can I respectfully say it's not an interesting question? <laughs> It's, there are many software. We actually operate bet uh, between many platforms. Uh, the Revit is good for coordinating with the different disciplines out there in the construction field because it's a BIM platform. Rhino is better for geometry. AutoCAD we use for plans and sections. But in fact, every time you're embedded in the world of a single software, you're limited by its terms of engagement. I think the, there are two ways in which we can think about software. One of them has to do with its generative potential. Some software have unique uh, tropes and devices that enable things that were never able to be done before. 
And some of it is a practical outcome of things that you just need to do to get done because conceptually what you have, your investment in the discipline of architecture is much more important than the way in which you do them. So in fact, a lot of the early parametric work that we did in Casa La Roca and the Zahedi house were not done on the computer. They were done by pencil, by hand, and the terms of parametrics were set forth in a pre-digital era. So my sense is to, if I'm going to recommend software, is to say that you need to have a, a healthy suspicion over each and every software that there are conceptual terms that need to preempt them on the one hand, but also a healthy speculative curiosity about them such that you can imagine generating new forms and new organizations through that very software. So, so why did you, why was Rhino so appropriate for at that point in time where, where you adopted it with respect to your own work and how did you, how did, how did? We didn't, we, we didn't, we never led the surge towards uh, software, we always inherited it. We did the most ridiculous things by hand when we should have done it with AutoCAD. We did the most absurd things with AutoCAD when we were supposed to do them with Form Z. We did the most ridiculous thing with Form Z when we should have done them with Rhino. And this continues, and I bet every one of them are doing the same ridiculous things. <laughs> well, I think that's all the time we have for uh, the questions. And thank you very much for, for a great lecture. We're very happy that you came to join us. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs>ผมผมคงต้องพูดอะไรนิดนึงเพราะว่าเสียดายที่เมื่อวานไม่ได้มาเอ่อมอสต์ลีออฟอาวเวอร์วิซิเตอร์เกสต์สปีกเกอร์ from Europe and Asia. Not many from US. I'm not sure, are you from US? Well, I'm from Iran originally. <laughs> <laughs> but I do live in the US yeah, now. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so, uh, technically uh, I'm Asian. Yeah, you'll be like only a day here. <laughs> will, will you be only one day and you go to Korea? Unfortunately, yes. yes. Um, but I have I, been here before. I know that. Um, I, I, I expect that you can advocate it for us that coming here and, and uh, we have a lot of people interested in the work from, from US also because, you know, after Obama take the throne and everything go down, you know, I, I, don't, I didn't mean that, <laughs> I didn't mean talk politics, but, but we, we didn't have, we have uh, Cameron, Cameron uh, Sinclair, all those uh, housing and, and yes. community people came, yes. but not many people from interest uh, to come to Thailand because it maybe it's too far. And, but, but because we listen to you and it's pretty much clear ผมว่าพวกเราเข้าใจเค้ามากนะเวลาเขาพูดภาษาอังกฤษว่าไหมเข้าใจมากกว่านะพวกยุโรปบางทีฟังยากเหมือนกัน I'm sorry saying that can you translate yes please I want to know He said that American accents are easier to understand than European accents Oh is that wrong It means you speak very clearly Okay so so how is an Iranian American accent <laughs> No 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 you don't have that thing until you speak some Arabic words uh, there were uh, I, this is serious now. I'm, I'm getting serious. I'm a president. I shouldn't be that joking. Um, I think that you say um, encourage me and discourage some people also because it's Dis looked like... Discourage. Listen. <laughs> if the process 
of doing architecture is that difficult, you know. I'm not sure it is real because I think it's, it's your instinct to come out, you know. You cannot put everything in a process. Yes. But the way that you come, because you want to teach us, you want to speak to us that your animation tell the story easier in, in one day. It's making me feel like next time I go to speak, I have to prepare more like you. How long <laughs> does it take you to prepare this presentation? This is your first time uh, here in, in Asia to speak? No, I, I, I've spoken a lot in Korea, in China, and have I spoken here before? I don't think I have, or maybe... You just spoke to me. Okay. <laughs> That was a very exclusive lecture, that one. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the most benefit uh, and very, very uh, I don't know, it's an analogy or a skepticism, whatever, but I feel very good about your lecture. In the next five years, I don't have to comb my hair. If I have to comb my hair, I will feel I good. A, that a lot of practice in this whole thing. I'm thinking about it. Okay. Okay, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, so it's now uh, time to, uh, we come to the end of the lecture. So thank you everyone for joining us and hope to see you all in the next session which will start at 2 p.m. So thank you very much. And don't forget to take your belonging with you when you leave this, the room. And about the uh, CDP point, don't forget to drop your ticket in front of the hall. Thank you.